Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Burkitt seminar on conservation covenants. We're concentrating today particularly on the benefit for conservation and wildlife charities. I think everybody um, on the call is probably familiar with Burkitt's, but this is just a brief summary of some of the main features. Um, just what we are at a glance. We're a top 50 um, firm. We've got five offices across the east of England and in London. So today um, I'm going to be speaking to you. My name is Deborah Sharples um, and I'm going to be speaking to you about um, some of the benefits of conservation covenants for charities. And then Hannah Harbottle, a senior associate in our commercial property team, is going to um, look at the, uh, the legal bits or as I like to think of it, she's going to do the difficult bit. So um, just in summary, we're going to cover the topics of what are conservation covenants, um, then look at how relevant they are and are they relevant for conservation charities. And then Hannah's going to talk about um, what's required in those covenants, how they're enforced and um, some of the very um, quite dry, sadly, legal principles. So conservation covenants, what are they? Conservation covenants are creatures of statute. They are private voluntary agreements between a landowner and a responsible body, um, which can be something like a conservation char charity or a public body. They allow for restrictive um, posit or positive obligations, which must fulfill a conservation objective. Um, they're capable of binding not only the current landowner, but also subsequent landowners. And so they have real potential to deliver lasting conservation benefits for the public good. So uh, there are a couple of um, terms that I've underlined in there. There's responsible body, which is a really important term for conservation charities. Um, certainly, I think it's, it's going to be a, a role that's um, very likely to be fulfilled by conservation charities. And I'll talk a little bit more about what responsible bodies are in a moment. And then I've also underlined a conservation objective. So conservation objective is an objective that preserves the natural environment or it can preserve um, archaeological, architectural, historical, artistic, um, or cultural um, qualities, and also can be used to preserve the setting of those. So um, where we use setting most familiarly in planning is the setting of a listed building. So maybe um, a conservation um, covenant may be used um, not to preserve an important feature itself, but to preserve the surroundings that make it look right um, where it stands. And then there can be ancillary um, purposes in a conservation covenant. So one of those ancillary purposes can be to provide access to land. Um, they are, um, I think, going to be a really valuable tool. They are flexible. Um, they allow the parties to negotiate their own terms to, su to suit their own circumstances. And they can be of different durations depending on the need. So um, the question is, how are they relevant for conservation charities? We're making the assumption here that they are relevant to conservation charities, and in my view, they most certainly are. Um, but there is a bit of a question, I suppose, which has arisen recently, is, is are they still relevant at all? Because they've been um, quite a while in the gestation. Um, they uh, are in the Environment Act, um, I think it's 2021, actually, I think the date in there is wrong. Um, and they have only very recently come into force. The, the provisions that bring conservation covenants into force um, came into force on the 30th of September 2022. So they're exciting, new and shiny. Um, and they're, one of the principal purposes that they are likely to be used for and that they're commonly um, talked about in the context of is biodiversity net gain. Um, under the same act, biodiversity net gain is um, going to become compulsory, we think, in November 2023. So assuming that um, comes about, then from November 2023, nearly all developments will be, have to provide a 10% uplift in biodiversity between the situation before the development takes place and the situation after the development has been completed. 
Um, this will need to be secured either by a Section 106 agreement, planning conditions or a conservation covenant. And therefore, conservation covenants are going to be a really important tool in securing that. But um, just about the time that conservation covenants legislation actually came into force, there was um, some major upheaval in the government, um, including a considerable amount of doubt being cast on the government's continuing commitment to biodiversity and conservation gain and conservation preservation. So um, there has been some doubt as to whether conservation covenants and indeed biodiversity net gain really have um, a future. Um, I think, however, that conservation covenants are here to stay. They've been a very long time in the making. Um, there was considerable discussion about them for a good number of years before the legislation was drafted. Um, and they fill a real gap in the toolkit that's available to us for securing conservation and ecological benefits. Um, and that's been a troublesome gap for some time. Um, the reason I say there's a gap is um, one of the tools that we frequently use to secure um, biodiversity net gain, informally, not the legislative sort, but just in association with development, and which we use to secure um, ecological um, mitigation and compensation is a Section 106 agreement. But a Section 106 agreement can only um, secure benefits within the local planning authority in which the development's taking place. So where those gains need to be secured elsewhere, which sometimes they do if you're, if you're making a significant um, compensation, um, sometimes that has to be secured outside the local authority area, there is um, a real limit on how that can be done. Um, there is another type of agreement under the Local Government Act um, that we sometimes use, but that has its own restrictions. So conservation covenants as the flexible tool they're going to be are going to be a valuable tool. I believe biodiversity net gain is here to stay. Um, it's, it's just so much in the public sort of zeitgeist now. Um, again, that's been a long time in the making in the legislation. So um, I think that will stay. Conservation covenants can secure so many other things than biodiversity net gain. And all of this fits really nicely with the aims of conservation charities. Um, so conservation covenants can be used to preserve the natural environment, as I say, archaeological, architectural, historic, anything, everything that conservation charities are looking to achieve can be achieved um, with the help of conservation covenants. So um, as I've said, that the conservation covenants are of relevance to conservation charities because they can directly secure the things that conservation covenants, conservation charities are trying to secure. Um, but equally, they um, can also provide, in my view, a um, real secure form of income for charities and also for influence for charities um, and conservation bodies over other people's land. Um, there are several ways in which they can do this and um, how that's done depends on the capacity in which the um, charity or body enters into the conservation covenant. So I think there are three roles in which um, charities can enter into conservation governments. Um, the first is as a uh, landowner. So many charities own land and conservation covenants, because they run with the land, as you will hear from um, Hannah, um, can be used to secure the way in which that land is managed if it's passed on by the charity to other people. Um, secondly, they can enter into it as a responsible body. Um, and I, I think this is going to be a really important role. Every conservation covenant will need a conservation, will need a responsible body. Um, and um, clearly, it seems to me, charities will be entirely reasonable to charge a fee for that role. It's an important role um, and um, it, it will carry with it obligations and responsibilities and burdens as well as um, benefits. So um, that, there can be fees charged for doing that. And then finally, as a service provider, um, 
in particular um, where developers have got to provide biodiversity net gain in relation to their developments, they may enter into agreements with landowners that landowners will um, enhance the biodiversity of their land to compensate for the loss due to a development. But the landowner may not be wanting to actually carry out the work themselves on their land. Um, and lots of conservation charities will have the skills that are needed in order to um, carry out that work. And again, in return for a fee, they can agree to carry out and manage that work um, and thereby um, be confident it's being done well. So um, just to mention before passing on, that some new guidance has just been published um, in relation to conservation covenants by DEFRA. It's called Getting and Using a Conservation Covenant, uh, published on the 18th of November and available on the internet. And that contains in it um, guidance on the roles of the various different parties in relation to conservation covenants. So I think well worth a read. Um, finally, before I pass on to Hannah to cover the law, um, I think it's worth mentioning responsible bodies because it is so important to charities. Um, these can be local authorities, they can be charities, they can be companies. Um, I fully anticipate that many of them will be charities, um, including the National Trust, um, lots and lots of local conservation charities, the RSPB, are all highly likely to do this. Um, they will have to be authorised and registered with the Secretary of State for the Environment before they can be an, um, a responsible body. And to be a responsible body, they have to be suitable. Um, one of the things that will make them suitable is that they have to have conservation as a main purpose. Um, the guidance that um, I just referred to, that's published by DEFRA, um, sets out a, a few more um, elements that the responsible bodies are expected to fulfill, um, they're fairly obvious things really, it, that they must have the skills and resources to um, carry out their obligations, including the management of the um, requirements under the conservation and the enforcement of those requirements. Um, and they must have contingency arrangements in place in case anything goes wrong um, during their um, tenure as responsible body. And they must surprisingly comply with the law. Um, they will have to um, submit an annual return as well to the Secretary of State. So um, lots and lots of exciting opportunities to my mind. Um, but as I said, um, conservation bodies will have to comply with the law. And Hannah's now going to um, come in and um, speak to you about the legal requirements and legal um, restraints. Um, we did have a question submitted in advance about um, what you can and can't do under a conservation covenant, the opportunities and restrictions, and hopefully this element of the talk will cover that. So thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Deborah. Um, that was very helpful. So as Deborah said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the legislation bit, which hopefully is not going to be um, too painful. I'll try and keep it short. So um, as we've said, this is these are provisions with the Envir Environment Act 2021. I'm um, just going to run through the, uh, the essential characteristics really of a conservation covenant, how to identify one, what it will um, look and sound like. Um, so it, it, it's an agreement in writing between the landowner and the responsible body. Um, uh, as Deborah's just, just talked briefly about the responsible bodies isn't necessarily the local planning authority. Um, and so the three sort of key <clears throat> Identifying characteristics are that it has a provision of a qualifying kind um, and the act specifies. So this is um, requiring the landowner either to do or not do something or to allow the responsible body to do something on a qualifying estate. And a qualifying estate is a, a, an estate in fee simple absolutes, a freehold or a lease for longer than seven years. So short term leases are not are not going to be relevant. Um, the second characteristic is that it needs to have a conservation purpose. So that's a purpose for conserving the natural environment or its resources or um, for a specific uh, interest, as Deborah's already said, so archaeological, architectural, artistic, cultural and historic. And so quite a broad range there, not just thinking of uh, green fields and land. Um, so and, and uh, the third purpose is that it needs to be for the public good, which is um, fairly self-explanatory. So the drafting should make it clear whether what you're dealing with is a conservation covenant 
I suppose it could be possible to enter into one inadvertently. So it's definitely uh, important to make sure your drafting is clear and, 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 and you may as well specify this is intended to be a conservation covenant so that, so that there can be no doubt. Um, so it's important to get to get those provisions in and, and make it clear what you're intending to create is a conservation covenant. Um, so just moving on to look at the sort of duration, how long do they last? Um, so they're capable of applying in perpetuity. That's going to apply to freehold land. Um, as I said, short term leases so for anything less than seven years is, is not going to be relevant. Um, the Law Commission recommends a minimum term of seven years. So it doesn't have to be for perpetuity for freehold land, but um, a, a good, good chunk of time um, it, it is obviously going to protect the covenant. Um, for as long as possible. It, as I say, it is possible to have a leaseholder involvement. I suppose you, um, you could have the scenario where a, a tenant enters into a conservation covenant without their landlord's uh, knowledge. That could have an impact on um, value of land. So it's important to ensure, and I suspect we'll see in leases, drafting starting to appear to specify it's typical to have a prohibition on, um, for example, applying for planning permission or doing certain works. Um, but I suspect we'll start to see prohibitions on entering into conservation covenants for uh, leasehold properties that might be relevant here. Um, so something to think about, depending which side of the fence you're on, as a freeholder, as a landowner, um, drawing down on those restrictions to make sure your tenants are not entering into covenants that you don't want. Similarly, if you are a, are a tenant and you think the land might be suitable, then make sure you are negotiating and including drafting that will allow you to do that, probably with prior consent um, within, your, within your lease document. Um, let's have a look. So enforcement and remedies, um, the nitty gritty bit. This is in section 125 of the Act. So as, I, as I've already said, it's an agreement between the parties, so the landowner and the responsible body. So the obligations are owed between them and enforceable between them. Um, but the conservation covenant is registrable as a land charge and must be registered as a land charge if you want it to bind successors in title. So it runs with the land. Um, a landowner will be released after they've parted with their ownership in the estate or, or the part of the estate if they're only, only disposing of part. Um, so registration of the, of the land charge is going to be particularly key to make sure that protection runs forward. You'd expect an obligation within, within the agreement itself to specify who is going to be responsible for registering. Um, so that's going to be key to make sure that's been done. And the remedies are not unusual, as we, we've listed there, specific performance, injunction, damages, um, typical remedies. But um, Deborah and I think it's, it's probably more likely that specific performance will be favoured here because um, sort of typical damages just to compensate somebody for a breach of covenant is unlikely to um, be as appealing here. The, the conservation covenants are intended to be for the public benefit, for the public good, and so a, a monetary payment is unlikely to satisfy um, a breach. So we think it's probable that specific performance will be used perhaps more than other um, remedies that you have for breach of contract, but we'll have to see. It's so new, um, you know, that nothing, no, no claims have been brought that we can we can sort of an, analyze that really. So um, time will tell how how the courts. Um, feel about breach and, and what, what remedies they impose. Um, uh, just put at the bottom there, six year limitation period. These are simple contracts, so it, it, it's a standard six year limitation period. So the defences that you might be able to bring for breach um, are, uh, there's three key ones. If, if it's beyond your, your reasonable control, uh, you, you, you couldn't perform the conservation covenant because something was beyond your control, you can rely on that defence. Um, the second is that there was an emergency to protect life and prevent injuries, a pretty common sense one. Um, you can rely on that as a defence for failure to comply with, with the covenants that you've given. And the third one, perhaps, more likely to see, I think, is, is the breach of statutory control point. So if complying with the Conservation Covenant would put you in breach of another um, piece of statute, you can um, use that as a defence, provided that, and the Act is quite clear, provided that you have made reasonable steps to obtain the authority to allow you to do whatever it is you're, you're supposed to be doing under the covenant. Um, so, so it's not just enough to say that you're stuck between a rock, rock and a hard place. You need to make a, 
a genuine effort to try and um, obtain consent. Um, and it's also not a defence for you to say, oh, well, you know, we, we've now realised that the site is uh, whatever a town and village green. If, if that um, designation was in place when you entered into the conservation covenant, you can't rely on that as a, as a defence. So your due diligence um, as with any land transaction is going to be really important um, at the beginning to check what designations affect that land and, and what knock on effect that is going to have for your compliance with the conservation covenants. Um, if, if they're granted for a long period of time, 30 years, for example, you, you obviously don't know what, what is going to happen to that land subsequently in the future. Um, but anything that does apply at the time that you enter into conservation covenants, you can't rely on that to say, oh, well, I'd be in breach of X by doing Y. Um, that's not going to be a satisfactory defence. So um, your, your usual due diligence for a, a normal property transaction is, is going to be key there to identifying what might be restricting your your use of the land so those are the uh, defenses let's have a quick look at discharge and modification so as i say the agreements potentially have have quite a long life and it might be necessary to make changes um, during the course of it so the the or, or even to discharge it so they can be discharged in agreement between the parties in writing um, you can replace the responsible body if necessary. Um, uh, there could be a, a, any number of reasons why a charity, for example, that is the responsible body um, might need to pass that baton on, on to somebody else. Um, if they no longer meet the requirements for a responsible body, if they no longer have a conservation purpose, for example, then, then you would need to think about um, moving that on to, some, to, to another entity. You can modify um, the conservation covenants during their term, um, but you can't modify away from the conservation covenant purpose. So you can't modify it to such an extent that it is no longer a conservation covenant. So it's got to have that, keep, keep that at its core. Um, the Act does give mechanisms for discharging um, it, through the courts, through the upper tribunal if necessary. So if agreement can't be reached between the parties, for example, that there is a, a, a fallback provision, although albeit an expensive one, I imagine, um, to, apply to, to apply to the upper tribunal. Um, so uh, as I said, a, a responsible body can, can nominate an alternative. There is also a, a fallback provision to the Secretary of State. Um, if a responsible body has ceased to be a responsible body, then the obligations of them under the agreement will pass to the Secretary of State and the benefit and burden will pass to the Secretary of State as well. But the Act makes a, a key distinction that any previous breaches, the liability for any previous breaches does not pass to the Secretary of State. So unfortunately, you can't rely on them as a, as a cash cow for any, um, any previous breaches that you want to pursue. So that's a very quick um, canter through the, the legal bits. Um, let's just have... I think we've got just a summary page to come and then I'll bring Deborah back and we will have a few questions. So just in summary, then how can the conservation covenants benefit um, the charities? Deborah's uh, spoken that, that there is potential for a really good um, uh, benefit for charities. They can offset the impact of, of developments. Um, which they might previously have been 100% opposed to. This does give the opportunity for potentially some, some gain and, and a good negotiating position. There's also a potential income stream for acting as a responsible body. Um, it, it, it's quite uh, potentially has quite a, a, you know, an onerous obligation to, to be that entity in a conservation covenant. And so you would expect to be compensated for that. So there's the potential for an income stream. Um, and acting as the responsible body, um, you can use your, your conservation wildlife knowledge, skills and experience to ensure that there is compliance um, with, with the environmental aims of the conservation covenant. So there is you know, lots to think of and, and it is potentially a, a really interesting, um, really interesting avenue for, for charities to explore. Um, so one of the ones that came in beforehand was how do charities express a willingness to become involved in the long term management um, of conservation projects? And that's a very good question. Um, 
uh, not sort of one that would trouble me because it's not my problem, as it were. Um, what I, all I can suggest really is there are a lot of um, land agents who are currently putting um, clients' lands forward to be available for biodiversity net gain and other conservation projects through conservation covenants. Um, so it could be well worth contacting some of those um, land agents so that you can say that you're willing to be a responsible body in the conservation covenants if needed. Uh, local planning authorities um, may also be able to pass on names to people who need to provide gain. Um, and finally, you know, put it on your website so when people search for a responsible body, they can find your particular charity. Um, there are quite a few more questions. I think we have answered quite a lot of them, Hannah. Um, one is, um, can there be, are we sure there can be positive obligations? I think so. I'm not a property lawyer, um, um, but the, what it says in the Act is that the um, agreements can require the landowner to do and not to do something on the land and yes. allow the responsible body to do something on the land. So I think possibly the concern is to do with la um, what I call ordinary covenants and their pass on ability. Mm. Um, but because this is a creature of statute, then the positive obligations will run um, in the same way as the negative obligations, like in a Section 106 agreement. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, there's 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 a um, question about that from from James. Thank you very much, and and a couple of others that I think we we've probably answered as we've gone through about um, uh, sort of enforceability and and um, modification and di and discharge. Um, um, I think the, the, there is an interesting question there, Hannah, about who would enforce. Um, and this, I think, is one of the, the interesting sort of new things with conservation covenants. Um, mm. I, I, the responsible body will have a, a big responsibility for enforcement. They're privately enforceable between the parties. So even mm. where it's being provided for biodiversity net gain and development, it's not local planning authority's job to enforce unless the local planning authority happens to be the responsible body. Um, but one of the things that was in the guidance I mentioned just published um, reminder to, to responsible bodies is big part of their role is going to be to make sure conservation covenants are actually fulfilled. Um, it, it's a slight peculiarity, I think, of these, that they have this public purpose and yet they're private agreements. So that's where responsible bodies come in, is bridging that gap and fulfilling, making sure that the public right is, uh, public interest is fulfilled mm. within a private contract. Uh, which is why, you know, Hannah was saying we, th we think that specific performance is more likely to be the remedy than damages between the parties. Yes, um, well, ho hopefully, hopefully the courts will take, will take that, that approach. Um, certainly, you know, it, it is intended to be for the public good and for, a, a, you know, a, a real physical benefit uh, rather than just sort of in, intangible funds, really. So hopefully they will utilise the specific performance remedy um, more often than others. Yeah, and then I think there's probably just time for the one more question. Um, which there's a question about who who might pay the responsible bodies to be the mm -hmm. responsible bodies. Uh, and the answer to that is, I think, the people who want the conservation covenant. So in a biodiversity net gain situation, the developer needs that conservation covenant in place. And um, therefore, the developer is likely to pay the landowner to provide the land and somebody to provide the service of the management and somebody to provide the service of being a responsible body. Um, and similarly, if, if entering into a, if a landowner wants to enter into a conservation covenant, for example, so that when they pass the land on to the next generation, they can be confident how it's going to be managed, then again, they, they will have to pay, in my view, a responsible body to carry, give them that service because it's something they need. Lovely. Thank you, Deborah, for that. And, and thanks, everybody, for your questions. It's great to see some interaction. Obviously, if you do um, have any other questions, drop either of us a line or, or give us a call. We're happy to, to talk it through. Um, we hope this was helpful. There will be a feedback form um, coming out, so please do fill that in. And, and I think there is a, a section on there where you can also add some extra questions which will come through to us. and We can, we can get in touch um, directly to, to have a chat about any other advice that you might need. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. And um, the recording will be available um, in a couple of days time if you want to share this with colleagues or refer back for reference. <laughs>